Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, what are some of the things that get your attention? How about uh, number 20 Purdue men's basketball team beating number 10 Maryland? That gets one's attention. That is if you're a Purdue fan, I suppose. How about a shiny brand new car? Does that get your attention? How about a, a beautiful day like that which God has blessed us on this day? Lots of things get our attention, but I'll tell you something that, that often gets our attention. This right here. Breaking news. When we see that flashed across the television screen or, or hear those words mentioned on the radio, we brace ourselves, do we not, for what might follow. Perhaps it will be a story about a huge natural disaster that, that threatens the lives of many people. Or maybe, heaven forbid, an, another terrorist attack on the scale like that of 9-11. Or it might be uh, some sort of catastrophe like a nuclear power plant releasing radioactive material into a community or a massive pileup on the interstate due to fog or one of these whiteouts that often happen around this time of year. Maybe an airplane crash or a train derailment or any number of horrifying possibilities. Yes, my friends, when, when things like that occur, it understandably gets our attention. And why does it get our attention? Well, for a number of reasons, but mainly because deep down we know that people who fall victim to such tragedies like these are really no different than the rest of us. That realization is even more pronounced when the tragedy strikes closer to home. Even though it may not make the headlines of CNN or Fox News, nevertheless, when, what, three college students uh, perish out there on I-69 from changing a tire, or a friend or a, a loved one dies of cancer at Parkview Hospital, or a neighbor's house burns down, it does make you wonder why. Why did that happen to them? Well, you know, people living back in biblical times, they were no different. They asked the same question. Even though they did not have uh, CNN or Fox News like us, they too, they had breaking news stories, like the ones we heard about in our gospel reading that quickly circulated around. They too encountered uh, natural disasters, accidents, acts of terror that took the lives of unsuspecting people. And they too wondered why. Why? Why do such things happen to certain people out there? You know, it's our human nature to look for a reason why bad things happen. Now, in some ways, it's actually good that we ask that question. I mean, evaluating the cause of a tragedy can, can help us, the, the living, to avoid that type of tragedy from occurring again. Think, for example, how much safer it is to fly in an airplane today because of the lessons learned from earlier aviation accidents. Or think of all the advancements that have been made in the field of medicine because researchers are always continuing to, to question how things work and learn from past situations. But you know, my friends, at the end of the day, no one has ever found a way to completely eliminate death from the picture, have they? Oh, sure, we can, we can build a safer automobile, but there are still fatal car accidents that occur. 
We can uh, discover new and improved drugs and treatments for diseases, but the fact remains there is no pill out there that will hold off death forever. Sooner or later, we all have a date with death. And the reason why that's so is because, well, we are all sinners, each and every one of us. And the wages of sin, the Bible tells us, is death. You know, that's the point that our Lord Jesus was making there in our gospel reading today from Luke chapter 13. You see, the people back then in their quest to know why bad things happen thought that perhaps the reason why, well, some people die a tragic, perhaps premature death is because they are somehow worse sinners than the rest of us. But our Lord Jesus refutes that notion. He refutes it. And without going into the specifics as to why some die in this manner and others die in that manner, Jesus instead brings it all together for us by pointing out the fact that regardless of the circumstances of our earthly demise, each and every one of us will die eternally. That is, each and every one of us are destined to spend eternity in hell, separated from one another, separated from God, our Creator, unless, unless we repent. Needless to say, repentance is a pretty big deal, according to the Bible. Something that is obviously necessary if we have any hope of having a relationship with God, both now and for eternity. But what exactly is repentance all about? What does it mean to repent? In order to help us understand this concept of repentance, this important concept, Jesus tells us a parable. That is, he gives us an illustration about a fig tree. He says about a fig tree, he says, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year, and I will dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Friends, from that parable, we learn some important things that relate to this concept of repentance. I'd like to take a closer look here at the lessons which Jesus wants to teach us through this parable. First of all, the man who is the owner of the fig tree, actually the owner of the vineyard in which the fig tree has been planted, he represents, that owner represents God. And you notice he has an expectation that his people, like that of the fig tree, his people will produce good fruit. That is, will produce these good works in our lives. Sadly, however, we fall short of his expectation. Instead of producing the good works which he created us to produce, we will often produce nothing at all. Or worse yet, produce things that are completely contrary to his will for our lives. Another thing this parable teaches us, though, is that God is patient, exceedingly patient. He is willing to give us ample opportunity to fulfill his purposes. And not only does he give us this opportunity, but even more so, he gives us the spiritual power and strength we need to live our lives as his obedient children. 
That spiritual power and strength is represented in this parable in the work of the gardener, the, the caretaker. You see, the, the, that gardener, that caretaker represents the spirit of Christ that is now in you and in me through the waters of our baptism. And that Spirit of Christ fertilizes us, if you will, with God's holy word and sacraments so that we can truly be the fruit-bearing Christians that we have been called to be. Ah, but you notice there in this parable, there is a limit to the owner's patience. The time does come when a tree that repeatedly does not bear the good fruit it's supposed to produce needs to be cut down. Similarly, God's patience also comes to an end. For anyone who refuses to repent of their sins and fails to produce the fruit that comes with keeping or that that comes with repentance in keeping with repentance. Now that's a pretty stern warning, I realize, a warning that reminds us of just how important this thing called repentance truly is. You know, in the original language of the Bible, the word that we translate here as repentance is the Greek word metanoia, which literally means a a change of mind. It conveys the idea of, say, initially going in one direction and then having this change of mind, a change of heart, if you will, and making a complete 180-degree turn and then moving in a brand new direction. Now, as it relates to the Christian faith, it means moving away from sin and disobedience and moving toward righteousness and obedience to God. But dear friends, as as helpful as that simple explanation and definition may be of repentance, the truth is it doesn't fully explain just how repentance actually works in the life of a Christian. You see, often people think that repentance is something that we are somehow supposed to work up inside of ourselves. It's as though it's our part of the deal in the salvation plan. We do our repentance and then forgiveness is something that God gives to us in response to what we've done, our repentance. Many may think of the equation going something like like this here. My repentance... Plus, God's forgiveness, well, that equals salvation. But that is not how it actually works. No, think back there to that parable. You know, the only way that that fig tree had any chance at doing what it was designed by God to do, that is to bring forth fruit, was for the caretaker to first do his work to dig around it and fertilize it. What that means is for us is that the work of repentance in our lives is actually not something that we do, but rather it is something that God does in us. It is the work of the Holy Spirit of God. Therefore, the key to repentance is letting God allowing him to do his work in us. Yeah, the key to repentance is getting yourself in that place where the caretaker of your soul, the Holy Spirit of God, can do his saving and sanctifying work. Well, you know, my friends, that place where he does that is here. Yes, here in the Lord's church, where God's word is faithfully proclaimed and his sacraments are administered in all of their truth and purity. 
In other, way, in other words, in the way in which God intends for them to be proclaimed and administered. Now, I know what you're thinking. Can, can God work apart from the ministry of His church? Of course He can. And He does. But in the ministry of His church, through the proclamation of His Word, the administration of His sacraments, that is where God has chosen to work. That is where he guarantees he will work. Hey, let's go back to this. Breaking news. Dear friends, due to the sin that has infested this world, has infested our own lives, the news agencies will always have job security. Yes, sadly, there will always be, what, tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. There is no escaping it. But let me tell you, there is escaping the worst tragedy of all. There is escaping the eternal death and separation from God. And it is called, repent of your sins and turn to God for forgiveness. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is Romans chapter 2, verse 4, where it says God's kindness, His kindness leads you toward repentance. What that tells us is don't think of repentance as something where you must somehow beat yourself up in order to achieve it. No, let God's great love for you lead you toward repentance. You see, when we begin to realize just how much God sacrificed in order to bring us into a saving relationship with Him. The sacrifice of His one and only Son to do that. My friends, we can't help but fall to our knees in repentant sorrow for those sins that we have committed, which our Lord Jesus bore on the cross in our place. And with that repentance, God delivers to us the most important news of all. His forgiveness and eternal salvation, which is yours and mine and for all. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.